Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back and uh, a very good day to you. This is Pregnancy to Parenting. I'm Khawa Solomon. Shukran and a big thank you for staying with us through our series with our fourth season now, alhamdulillah. Baby's nice and big, grown, and you're getting to know that personality, that character within that tiny little baby that we saw grow up, alhamdulillah. We did quite a few shows on nutrition and looking at weaning, um, even something that we we focused quite a bit on extensively is premature babies. And I think for me, uh, pre, uh, preemie nutrition, for me, premature babies just kind of stands out in all of um, you know the birth and the pregnancy series. So we, you'll be hearing much more on premature babies later on in the season as well. We welcome back uh, Nutripeds in studio with us, Kath McGaw, uh, the clinical uh, dietitian in studio with us, guiding us. And also do note that you can find details on her website, which is www.nutripeds.co.za for great advice and updates and recipes as well. So last week we covered quite a bit on premies, very importantly, not realizing how much attention is needed there as well. We spoke about weaning. And one question I just want to deal with before we move on to our food allergy incident because that was meant to be part of Premi, uh, the Premi show, but it's it's so focused that we, uh, inshallah, we will be focusing on, on this one alone. But just coming back quickly to um, a question that popped up uh, from one of our viewers. Uh, let me get the name right. Mom Wahida Jusup uh, Muhammad. And she mentioned that a two-week-old baby, formula fed baby, um, she wants to just have some advice with regards to how to prevent constipation. Just two weeks old, baby is, I, I don't know the full story, but just some advice with regards to weaning and how she can help with that. Let's start there. And uh, obviously at two weeks old, she's not going to start any solids as, mm. as yet and going to wait till at least 17 weeks to do that. Okay. Formula fed babies definitely are more prone to constipation. Um, that's due to a number of factors. One of them is that the iron... Um, that is used in formula can be quite constipating okay. um, for versus like the the gentle iron that is found in breast milk so it does have less of a constipating effect another reason why formula fed babies are a high risk of constipation is because the lactose which is the milk sugar mm. is much lower in formula milk than what it is in breast milk and lactose actually acts as a bit of a laxative okay. and helps those stools um, to come quite quite easily but one thing to make sure when you formula feed in is that mm. you follow the tin um, in terms of how many scoops per mils of water okay. because if you don't get that right and you say for example make it too concentrate you've got a higher risk of constipation okay. so if your formula fed baby is struggling with constipation mm. give it a little bit of time the, the little system will adjust to it mm. but you can always add a little bit like about 15 mils or so of cooled boiled water after a formula feed okay. just to give them a little bit more liquid Extra. with with the with their formula and okay. um, if they if it still continues to persist they might need to just speak to their healthcare professional and see because there are some formulas that cause constipation in a baby more than others okay. and they might just need to get some advice and guidance on that but not jumping to any of the um the, the natural remedies right now at that, at that yes. moment in time is too, but it's too early. Sometimes sometimes um, uh, they will be prescribed like Laxon, which is just a natural milk sugar, which is the lactose. Okay. There's nothing wrong with that. Parents get very scared because they think mm -hmm. it's a laxative, but it really is just that extra milk sugar okay. that would technically be found in breast milk. And that often just helps and makes all the difference. Okay. So that, that's safe to use, but not anything hectic, no. Okay. Hopefully, inshallah, that helps Mom Wahida. And uh, thank you so much, Kath, for that answer. So allergies, food allergies, big one. We spoke a bit about it uh, when it came to the difference between lactose and um, the milk allergies. Okay. Now let's look at, if we could quickly recap on allergies, just some basic rulings concerning babies that are born into families that are prone to you know, certain sensitivities and allergies. Okay. Um, so if your child is a high-risk baby, in other words, they're born into a family where both mom and dad mm -hmm. have got food allergies um, or display eczema or had eczema as children and possibly asthma as well, um, we don't really treat them hugely differently other than what we do is we're much more aggressive with the introduction of solids. Okay. Really encourage breastfeeding, so that would be first prize if mom can breastfeed because um, the breast milk really acts as a, a lining of the gut. And I think we need to understand that the little gut, the colon and the intestines of your mm. baby, is actually an organ of the immune system. Mm. And so if we can create that to be extremely healthy, 
it can actually assist with allergies because allergies are a reaction of the immune system. Okay. And breast milk does that in a wonderful way. And then when you introduce your solids, don't do it before the age of 17 weeks or four plus months. Mm -hmm. But once you start introducing, you can be quite aggressive when it comes to introducing your protein foods like egg and fish, um, nut butters, um, chicken, your gluten and your wheat, mm -hmm. soya, and those type of proteins, you want to expose that baby to them. Okay. So that the baby does, if the baby has got a risk of allergies and a bit of a hyper immune system, you want the baby to be slowly sensitized to those foods so that they don't react mm -hmm. if they only get introduced much later on. And as you mentioned before um, in the previous shows that mom should be introducing it already in her diet through pregnancy and, and yes. breastfeeding. Yes, okay. absolutely. Very important that mom doesn't exclude any allergens out of her diet unless mm. it's her allergen, obviously. Okay. <laughs> so looking at um, the most common food allergies that are... Um, that, that, that are available that we see as you mentioned now and maybe should we look at uh, when when realizing that yes okay the child is born into f food allergy um, family should we do uh, you know preventative tests ahead of time already and when can can that be done yeah that's a really good question so our most common allergens are the ones I've mentioned I'll just recap so it's your egg okay. it's your cow's milk protein your soya protein your fish um, which includes your seafood, mm -hmm. your tree nuts, which is your almonds, macadamians, cashews, then mm -hmm. your peanuts, which are separate, and then your wheat and your gluten. And those are your more common types of allergens. There are others, like you get the latex allergy, which is um, a banana, avo, um, okay. those, those type of fruits contain the latex protein, and those can, some babies can be allergic to them. Mm -hmm. And then you get the more rare ones, like your preservative allergies, like sodium benzoate and that sort okay. of thing. But those are not the ones that we commonly see early on. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, and with regards to blood tests, there's a lot of um, discrepancy. We thought at stage you could only test at a year old. Mm. Um, we know that we can test for the allergies that cause what we call anaphylactic reactions, in other words, the chest closes up, the baby can't breathe, things like that. I would suggest that if the baby comes from a high-risk family, mm -hmm. that you wouldn't rush off and do blood tests initially. I would do the things we mentioned. Mom must make sure she eats all the allergen foods in her pregnancy, okay. continues to eat them while she's breastfeeding, mm -hmm. and then, then introduces to them during the weaning process of the baby. If at any point the baby shows a reaction towards one of those mm -hmm. allergen foods, that would be an indication then to go and do blood tests okay. and see if the baby's reacting to any of the others. Mm -hmm. As long as the baby's been exposed to those foods. Okay. If you do the blood test and the baby's never been exposed to that, there's going to be a false negative possibly. All right. And so you're not really going to get a good result. Mm -hmm. yeah. Which is more effective though, the blood test or the skin prick test? Um, they both they both play a role. The skin prick we don't really do in very young babies. Okay. Um, but they will both basically, as long as you always read your blood test, your skin prick test, mm. along with the clinical symptoms that you notice in, in the okay. child, that's also really, really important. And remember that you're only going to be able to test for one allergy pathway. Okay. But when we spoke about cow's milk protein allergy, we mentioned that there's two different pathways mm. there. And the one that causes more problems and issues is normally the one which we call the non IgE mediated, which means you can't test for it. You can oh. only see clinical symptoms. Okay. So, so your guidance on when having the test done is about after 12 months? 12 months or no, so? not necessarily. Like I say, if your baby shows an allergy, mm -hmm. allergic reaction to a food, then you can go and do the other blood okay. test. So that would be in your weaning age group. So any time from kind of five months okay. onwards. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Now, I know you're not an allergist, but according to research, what is what are the findings when it comes to why food, food allergies are um, found in certain families and in, in babies? What are the research done? Where, where does it all come from? Sure. If I knew the answer, I think I'd be a multi-billionaire. Oh. But so there is, there's a lot of hypotheses and a lot of thoughts about it. There's not a lot of conclusive. I think we we thought it was initially exposure that caused allergies. Mm. And so that's why we told everyone to stop eating peanuts and stop eating eggs okay. and stop eating that. Then we realized, no, that's actually making it worse. Mm. So we know that it's definitely important to to expose mm. children to all the allergens like we've just mentioned. So that's given us a different take on it. So I, one of the underlying and one of the, the thinkings that makes the most sense to me 
is your the gut and the immune system. Okay. And if you can get that to be really strong, and mm-hmm. um, we've got a better chance of the child being able to tolerate a range of different foods. Okay. So parents should be shouldn't be going out to blame themselves just yet. No, no definitely. <laughs> or their genes. No. It's yeah. your it's your family. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Last week we looked at you know the um, the different sort of, uh, of 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 specific allergies being milk. Uh, the protein and the lactose mm. intolerance. If we could just recap a little, and I want to look at the protein um, which are found on most grocery shelves that we don't, the milk protein uh, products that are found on most grocery shelves that we don't really mm. recognize. Maybe just look at how we can identify that quickly before we take our break. So just to recap, cow's milk protein allergy is an allergic reaction of the body mm-hmm. towards the cow's milk protein which is found in cow's milk which is comes through in formula and if mom is drinking cow's milk that protein can come through in her breast milk and so the babies have an allergic reaction to that cow's milk proteins may are about 22 different proteins okay. of which the dominant ones are casein and whey protein mm-hmm. and casein is the most common allergen that's the cause of often the allergic reaction in cow's milk okay. proteins lactose intolerance lactose is the sugar that is found in all mammal milks, mm. so goat's milk, cow's milk, camel milk, and obviously mom's milk, mm. has high quantities of lactose, lactose in it, of which mom's milk has the highest. That's not an allergy, it's an intolerance. Okay. So if the, if the child doesn't produce the enzyme to break down the sugar, because sugars are broken down by enzymes, and yeah. if the child doesn't produce that enzyme, then they are be possibly going to be intolerant to okay. lactose. Okay, I want to I want to look at w- what we can find in, on the um, grocery shelves and where the hidden ingredients are, where there's actually mo- milk protein or lactose um, in sure. there, and not uh, realizing. We take a short break, but more stay with us as we discuss food allergies. Back in a moment. Assalamu alaikum. Welcome back. Food allergies. That is the name of the show today. And uh, this is something that I know that we can speak about for hours when mom, moms come together with their kids and they talk about, oh, my kid can't eat this and he doesn't want to eat that. But that's a different show. Fussy, picky eaters. We're going to deal, deal with that uh, in a show after this. But inshallah, food allergies, it's a big one. And you are so scared, you know, to give your child certain products. And there's always this, this hesitation. So today, let's put all of that um, uh, down to, you know, questionable myths. And inshallah, Kath, uh, our uh, pediatric um, nutrition dietitian, nutritionist is in studio with us to chat to us more on this topic. Uh, please do interact with us if you have any questions. Unfortunately, we won't be able to deal with it in the show, but we will follow it up with Kath. And Kath is always available to us, thank goodness. And we'll follow it up with the, with the next show with your questions, Q&A. So um, Pregnancy to Parenting, that's the Facebook page. Like it and uh, you can pop your questions, comments or queries. Right, so just before the break, we um, stopped with recognizing, you know, the milk and the protein and the lactose allergies. But what are the common product products that are found on the grocery shelves that we don't often recognize? And how important is it for us to read labels? If your child has got allergies, um, you definitely have to learn to read labels. Um, the big sometimes misconception is that cow's milk protein is only found in cow's milk. Yes. Some parents don't realize that yogurt and cheese mm-hmm. and the, the products of dairy also will contain these cow's milk proteins. The, they can use a number of things with regards to labeling. The new legislation with labeling is quite definite, however, and if there is cow's milk protein, it should actually state on the label cow's milk protein. Okay. Um, but there's a, there's a kind of a lag in the changing of labels mm. um, and also depending from where the products come. So moms need to be a bit vigilant. Words like casein, which I mentioned earlier, mm. is a cow's milk protein. Sometimes I might just say whey protein on it and then that will indicate cow's whey. milk protein. Okay, yeah. so that's W-H-E-Y. W-H-E-Y. So whey, casein, and then um, cow's milk, dairy, if it says obviously either of those. Mm. And then there's quite a host of other other names also that um, a mom would need to be familiar with. Mm-hmm. However, like I said, the legislation is that if there is a cow's milk protein, it should technically say 
cow's milk protein on there for the, the allergic child. Okay. And then obviously you get some um, different retail stores where they have got little allergen boxes mm. and then there they will list the allergens. Yes. And that's really, really helpful. And I often say to mom, especially in the beginning when she's getting used to the allergy, um, to actually shop at those places mm. where it can be quite obvious. So if unsure or in doubt, rather leave it if you're not 100% okay. sure. Um, but otherwise, those are the words that you will look for. But all dairy products will have cow's milk protein in it. Okay, so, so even some cereals as well. Yeah, and then obviously you've got a range of, of your kind of products that are ready to eat, ready mm. to feed. I mean, custard will have cow's milk protein in it. Like you say, some cereals. There's some infant cereals. You must always question if it says just add water. That means okay. it's probably got cow's milk protein in it. Mm. So if your child is allergic to cow's milk protein, rather go for the ones where you have to add their milk. Okay. Because then generally it doesn't have any cow's milk protein in it. All right. So let's look at other noted common um, allergies that are found uh, on the shelves and that we should be afraid of. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Afraid is really because it just, just chases you away. But with regards to kids in special care, what are the, the other common allergies you've mentioned? You listed the mm -hmm. um, allergies, but how do, how do we kind of deal with it and note it that just be a little bit more careful and sort of the, 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 the way to go when, you know, introducing it slowly, as mm -hmm. you say? So I think, like I mentioned, you need to be quite vigilant with your label reading. Mm. So if, if there's, you notice that most of the products these days will say made in a factory where there may be nuts okay. or may contain traces of nuts. And that's really the chance that that product has got nuts in is highly unlikely, but mm. they're covering themselves. Yes. So that eliminates a whole lot of products for that poor child with a nut allergy. Um, so that's why I always said it's good to kind of do this initially under the guidance of a healthcare professional that can mm -hmm. guide you because otherwise you tend to eliminate a lot of foods from your child's diet unnecessarily. You can't go wrong if you kind of go back to basics and cook mm -hmm. your stuff from scratch and you have the less labels you have in your house, the less stress you are of what's in them. So food, <laughs> fresh foods. Fresh foods, yeah, <laughs> obviously the best. Um, what you want to do over time, like you were saying, is build some tolerance hmm. um, with regards, but that will depend on your child's allergy and the allergy reading as to how you go about it. Sometimes there's a food challenge that needs to be done that will be done in hospital hmm. if the child has very severe reactions to food. Um, so that again, that sort of thing, depending on the allergy that your child has and the the extent of the allergy will determine how you're going to introduce it. But it is good practice mm. to push your healthcare professional as to when you can start reintroducing it. Because if you give a little bit on a regular basis, it can build tolerance. Okay. For example, some children with an egg allergy mm. can actually tolerate baked eggs, so eggs yes. in a baked product. Yes. And that's one way to actually build tolerance. Over time, then, they'll be able to tolerate like a scrambled egg. Mm. And the last thing they would be able to tolerate would be touching a raw egg or a raw egg. Okay. So, but that's kind of the progression, for example, mm. with the egg allergy. I can actually vouch for that because originally my daughter was um, recognized as um, being allergic to egg white. Okay. And, um, and, and somehow I found when she had cake or a muffin, she didn't have any sort of reaction. Okay. So when it came to um, you know questioning that when I took her to the allergy, she said, yes, actually that's a, a good thing because it's mm. the process of introducing her and slowly helping her overcome the egg allergy. So Absolutely. now she's, she's having some scrambled eggs as well. That's I'm not, a, not sure about the raw egg. I haven't <laughs> tried that one yet. But with regards to food allergies, I know this is a big question. Mm. Are they ever preventable? There's things that we can do that can decrease the risk of food mm. allergies, but to say that it would prevent it altogether is, is not, I wouldn't be able to say that. But the things that definitely can decrease the risk would be to, for mom to include all the allergens during pregnancy and breastfeeding. Mm -hmm. And then the second thing is to breastfeed exclusively okay. for those first 17 weeks. And that shows a, a definite reduction in eczema and asthma not absolutely that child won't have but it can definitely show a reduction and then to not delay weaning and okay. especially the protein allergen foods don't delay those like we thought we should mm. it's actually counterproductive and works actually the opposite right. so introduce those food post 17 weeks start your child on some solids and get those protein foods started by about five five and a half months okay
So feeding our allergic babies, now establishing there is an allergy, this is yeah. what um, my baby is allergic to, fru uh, protein, milk protein, nuts, um, egg whites, mm -hmm. all of those lovely stuff. Um, guide us through fe feeding those highly allergic babies and what are the what sort of precautionary measures we, sh we should take in because now we're tiptoeing sure. around every sort of food. It's quite, it is, the children who have multiple food allergies, you get a, a syndrome called multiple food allergies of infancy sure. and that's very stressful because mm -hmm. they tend to almost react to almost everything. Um, you have to do that alongside a healthcare professional because the risk is that you can delay a food introduction which mm -hmm. can cause other problems like fussy eating and um, or children with aversions to certain textures and things like that. Okay. It can cause a lot of paranoia and kids pick up on that of mom's kind of feelings and paranoia. So that was the, that's the one advice. If your child has multiple food allergies or mm -hmm. even one or two food allergies, just seek one or two consults with a healthcare professional that specializes in that area mm -hmm. and they can really just guide you through the process so that you make sure your child doesn't end up with deficiencies. Okay. So for example, if you're cutting out all cow's milk protein from your child's diet, um, you might need to supplement with a calcium supplement mm. and a vitamin D supplement. Um, so what you, and if you find that your child has multiple food protein allergies, you might end up that the child doesn't have sufficient protein in mm. their diet, and you might need to find a substitute way to actually include that okay. into the child's diet, and um, that, that should be done under, also under guidance. So it's it's not a, it's not an easy thing, and you, you don't try and navigate it all on your own. Mm. Um, and then also don't delay introduction and reintroduction of the allergen foods. The ultimate goal when I see a, a patient that comes to me with food allergies is how much foods can I give, not mm. how much food should I take away. And sometimes it boils down to if a child's got multiple food allergies, we eliminate the most hectic ones and we include little bits of the other ones just mm. so that the child can have as much of a balanced diet as possible. Okay, so um, don't be too stressed out yeah. about it. Yeah. <laughs> right, so um, any sort of signs we need to look out for now as well with babies uh, with certain food allergies, recognizing it or not, what are the first reactions that comes from an, uh, from an allergic um, or food allergy? Well, if you're looking at like cow's milk protein, mm. the most common thing would be gut. So their stools, okay. they can often end up with uh, blood in their stools or very mm -hmm. mucousy like stools. Okay. Almost looks like there's a whole lot of mucus that's gone into their stool. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously a lot of discomfort, um, could be very bad reflux. Mm -hmm. Some children could have quite a violent reaction when they eat that food, they just projectile vomit. Mm -hmm. And that should tell you something. Um, so there's, there's various reactions, could be a skin reaction. You can also get an immediate reaction, which means it will happen within half an hour to two hours of actually taking in the food. Okay. And that normally could be diarrhea, projectile vomiting, breaking out in hives, big welts mm -hmm. um, over the body. Um, generally, at first exposure to the allergen, the child's not necessarily going to get their throat closed up mm -hmm. and everything. That scary reaction we hear of. But if your child has any of that breaking out in hives, skin reaction, gut reaction, vomiting, mm -hmm. you need to go and get that child assessed because the second introduction of that allergen could cause a more severe reaction with regards to the breathing. Okay. So um, so those are the, the signs. Then you get the delayed reaction, and that's where you give egg today, egg tomorrow. Child's okay, maybe a bit niggly by day two. By day three, your child's got like an eczema-like look no. about it. Um, and those are the most difficult allergies to mm. diagnose because... You don't know, was it related to that? But that's why we say when introducing, and I mentioned it in the weaning program, when introducing the protein foods mm. and the high-risk allergen foods, do one new one for three days in a row, okay. and then if all good, you can introduce another new one. Okay. We're looking at growing out of food allergies as well. Is that even possible after the short break? So stay with us. Food allergies, back in a moment.
Assalamu alaikum, a very good day to you. Welcome back. We're in our last segment of food allergies and I know there's still lots more to discuss but please uh, comment on our uh, Facebook page Pregnancy to Parenting and we'll definitely pass it on to Kathy where she can where she can help. I'm sure she'll oblige. Looking at outgrowing certain allergies and this is a big thing because I've heard of these stories and I say, oh, you know, it's just a phenomenon. It's not really true. What's really going on? If we could just maybe look at that, what's really going on with the body that does occur? You hear of kids that um, had very bad eczema as children and then as adults, they say, okay, I just outgrew it. I also at one stage thought I was allergic to fish and there was such something in the fish. And um, when I changed my lifestyle, my diet and certain um, um, of food uh, dietary requirements, I, I also outgrew it. So, you know, we understood the difference between food allergies and maybe just sensitivities. But looking at the possibility of outgrowing food allergies, is that is it real? Absolutely. And often it's the more severe allergies that get outgrown. So the okay. baby that's been a nightmare for that first year of life is mm. often the baby that will outgrow their food allergies. However, we used to think food allergies were outgrown a lot sooner and we've now got a bit, a bit of a longer window period, which is nice, because otherwise we used to say to parents, oh, by a year, your child would have outgrown their cow's milk protein allergy, um, which is in probably 90% of the cases possibility. However, some children only by the age of five will outgrow it. So okay. we, we know that, that there is a, a window. The, the allergies like peanut allergy, um, tree nut allergies, and even your egg, they generally are more long-term allergies, mm -hmm. specifically peanut allergy. Um, why some children outgrow and some don't is probably largely due to their, their immune system and the way their body is reacting. I think if we understood more about exactly what causes allergies, we would understand about exactly why they outgrow allergies. Like I said earlier on, you've got two different allergy pathways. The one we can really test for in the blood test, um, those ones can take a few years to outgrow. And then you've got the non-IgE pathway, and those often outgrown by the age of a year old. Okay. And similarly, some adults can actually develop new food allergies, like in their 30s or in their 40s. Mm. And that's also quite common, why the immune system suddenly finds a food offensive and dangerous I'm not sure, but that can happen at a later stage in life. Is, is that recognized as a true f a food allergy? Absolutely, okay. absolutely. And you find it's quite common amongst adults with regards to fish and shellfish. Oh, yes. <laughs> and that seems to be something that, you know, they, they'll be fine and all their life have eaten shellfish and fish and then suddenly they start to have a reaction to that. Okay. So yes, your child can definitely outgrow the food allergies, but like we said, you need to help the body by building slow, slow tolerance mm. to those food allergens. Um, and depending on the severity will determine how you do that. If your baby's got a severe peanut allergy and nut allergy, I definitely won't advise you to do that on your own at home, okay. but you can build tolerance in the hospital um, environment or under the guidance of a good pediatric allergist or a healthcare professional that is able to guide you along that route. Okay. Well, the big question is as well, is can food, nutrition, a certain diet help alleviate or reduce certain food allergies as well? Definitely, um, like if we, if we use the, the idea that your gut, which is your a very large organ in your body, mm. because it covers such a large expanse of space, um, if that is super healthy and is optimally healthy, mm. Um, your risks and it lowers your risks of allergies and possibly also then looks at assisting you overcome those allergies. So what we're saying is a healthy diet that's low in processed foods, low in sugar to almost mm. avoid in your refined sugars um, and making sure you get all your fresh vegetables and fruits so you've got all those good um, nutrients and vitamins and minerals. And that's definitely going to set your body up to be in a better space mm. um, to actually um, fight these allergies. Okay, so best uh, to go to a professional and guide you on how to eliminate through still yes. eating. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Okay, so any myths and misconceptions around food allergies that we get quite hyped up about that you find commonly with, with um, parents coming to visit you and saying, um, okay, I've heard this and that about nuts or mm. milk, and which is the common one, and fish, and um, I'm, I, I just don't feel okay with mm. giving my child egg. And, and any sort of myths that we should watch out for that we get quite worked up for? Uh, yeah, I think the, the biggest things that we're trying to, the constructs we're trying to break down at the moment is the actual ones that we as the health professionals have put out there, which mm. is to avoid your allergen foods okay. until a year, or you know, introduce your child to egg just before their nine-month MMR injection and things like that. And so... 
that's the main thing. If we can say, no, that, that you don't need to delay introduction of your allergen foods. You actually want to do it in your early stages of weaning. So that's the one myth. The other myth is that my child is allergic to lactose. So just to bring that back, remember lactose yes, is the milk do. sugar. <laughs> it's not protein. Your child can't be allergic to milk sugar. They can be intolerant to to the lactose, okay. um, which means they don't produce the enzyme to break it down, and that can cause a problem. Um, but it's got nothing to do with an allergy, and I think that's also often I find that parents come into my practice. Another myth is that if my child's allergic to cow's milk protein, I can give them goat's milk or camel milk or another mammal milk, and you've got to be very careful because, like we said, Cow's milk protein has about 22 different types of proteins and, it's and they're cross-reactive oh. with the goat's milk mm -hmm. and things like that. And those type of milks are tested and tried on young babies. Okay. So they're not actually good practice to feed your child those. Advice to parents who, um, who have babies who currently suffer from food allergies or very severe eczema and even food uh, sensitivities who feel really, really mm -hmm. stuck. I think firstly, don't do it on your own. So mm -hmm. you walk, get a healthcare professional that you trust and can relate to, to walk alongside you because it's a long journey. Mm -hmm. Speak to other parents for support. What's wonderful though is we've got so many more products available these days. It's not half as difficult yeah, to substitute for alternatives. Mm -hmm. Like we, we couldn't do that in the past, yeah. but now it's almost so easy if your child is allergic to certain foods to actually find substitutes so that they can still have the birthday cake and still have the biscuits and still have those nice little treats that we often f used to have to eliminate. Um, and then, yeah, just make sure that your child, um, that you do do ask your healthcare professional about re-challenging and retrying because your child might have outgrown it and then you're still avoiding it. Mm. So your goal is always to try and get that food into their diet at some point. Yeah, no, I've heard some of some crazy tofu and popcorn mm -hmm. parties. <laughs> yeah. I know colorant, um, yeah. you know, in for, for little ones and uh, we, we as parents can get quite worked up about that. <laughs> your thoughts on stress-associated reactions compared to an actual um, food allergic reaction. Are there any cases where, you know, you, as, as you said earlier on, you know, when the reaction is delayed and then it's kind of mm. difficult pinpointing what the allergy is. But does babies experience, like uh, I've heard adults, which um, the eczema is associated to stress. Uh, I, don't, I don't know how true that is, but we can discuss it during a mm. later show. But when you look at babies, young babies, is, is that um, maybe a mistake also or a common problem that you guys are facing with when it is not really a food sensitivity or an allergic reaction but just maybe some stress babies um, I think I think in, especially when it comes to the gut reactions mm -hmm. I think you do get babies that are much more highly strung we call them the sensitive babies and they react to the environment very sensitive to different sensory information and they get very overwhelmed with noise mm -hmm. and very easily overstimulated and those babies tend to get a lot of gut issues and that might be mistaken for an issue with their formula or breast milk oh, yes. but actually it's more their stress. Eczema we know can definitely be again also stress related and something you would need to tease out. Mm -hmm. A lot of the times eczema has got very little to do with food allergies and more actually environmental okay. and stress. So I think um, that is definitely something to consider, but at the same time, I don't think a parent should just dismiss it to say my child's a stressed child. Go and check your child out and mm. check the allergy out and, and just see if you can assist in any way. Um, but you can also keep in the back of your mind that stress can be playing a role. Now, something that's going to lead up to our next show is uh, fussy and picky eating and even babies that are ill. Does a premature uh, the show that we did before and uh, you know kids with food allergies do they end up being picky and fussy eaters which is a, a whole ball game mm -hmm. on its own there's a there is a higher risk you can just imagine if you are basically having to avoid a whole lot of food in your child's diet mm -hmm. we know that there's a window of introduction when a child's very receptive to new foods and flavors and textures and often in the case of your prem baby, which could have been a sickly baby, mm -hmm. um, you might have delayed introduction, or that baby's got a whole lot of issues, sensory issues around different textures, you might delay introduction. Your child with allergies, you're going to avoid the allergen foods or the foods your child's allergic to. Mm -hmm. And so when your child starts to outgrow those allergies, they do become a lot more fussy and could possibly end up being quite a picky eater. Mm. There's also, as we'll discuss in the next show, there's a lot of emotions attached to picky eating and fussy eating. Okay. And when you have a child that's either prem 
or child with multiple food allergies, you can mm. become quite an anxious mom. And, and that often happens around meal times. Mm. And a child can pick up on this and they can actually play on that around about the toddler age group. So it definitely so predisposes <laughs> children to that, yeah. It's amazing how much they can pick up just with, with our reaction. I know. We've, we've been in the world for like 30 odd years. <laughs> and they've just been for a year or two and they, they're so clever. They're so clever. All right, so just to round up food allergies and I think advice overall to moms, grandparents, caregivers and guardians, in fact, who are, are looking after little ones and your advice to them when starting weaning or just recognizing a food food allergy because there can be quite a lot of emotions mm. attached to that mm. and a lot said to each other mm. as well. So I think that the, just to recap, your, your best chance to decrease the risk of food allergies, not necessarily guarantee prevention, but decrease mm. it would be to include all the allergen foods, so all foods during your pregnancy, other than those you're allergic to, yeah. um, all foods during breastfeeding, um, wean your baby at an appropriate age, don't delay weaning, and include your protein foods early on. If your child does have an allergy, like a peanut allergy, speak mm. to those caregiving your, to your child so that everyone is on the same page. It might mean speaking to the school as well and mm. declaring it a nut-free zone, which a lot of schools do. Yeah. Um, because those can be quite severe allergies. And then get in healthcare professionals to walk alongside you so that you don't have to do it all on your own. Mm -hmm. And um, just yeah, sit down with grandparents and explain to them what's actually going on. And um, possibly even give them ideas on how to treat your child differently um, with regards to food so that they don't feel that they're hard done by by now not being able to give the chocolate because it's got nuts and cow's milk in it, but make suggestions of other alternatives. And go and visit your local stores and mm. see the amazing range of alternatives. It's not as difficult as what yeah. you think. I think tofu you can turn into anything. <laughs> Thank you so much once Pleasure. again, Kath. We'll see you in the next show as we deal with uh, fussy, picky eaters. Uh, that is Kath McGill from NutriPleads. Please visit their website for more information. You can get some great recipes as well when it comes to an advice for um, any babies with allergic reactions. There's also a chat happening on there as well. Please join us in our next show. Shukran so much for staying with, with us. A big thank you. Please like our uh, Facebook page, Pregnancy to Parenting, and uh, you can pose your questions on there. Till the next time, wassalamu alaikum. Yes, I did all your observations for today. Um, your blood pressure was very good, a little on the low side. Um, but you said, Miss, you had um, low blood pressure yeah. sometimes. But you will see sometimes when you come to the clinic, it will be a little um, low. Then the next day when you come, it will be normal. So it changed all the time during pregnancy. So that was okay. And your um, iron levels was also fine. Your iron levels was 11.5. So that's what we actually advise the patients to continue using the vitamins. So when you come back, maybe with your next visit, there will be improvements. And then sometimes we can also notice when they come back that they didn't use the vitamins because suddenly there's a, 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 a lag down in the, the iron levels of the patients. And your urine test, I think, your urine test was also fine in the HIV test and the the filler tests that we've done was also negative, but always remember we repeat it later in pregnancy and that will be at 34 weeks, so we will repeat that to test. And we also had previous blood, um, bloods, the RPR, that was also negative, so all your tests is fine. So I used to tell the patients um, it's their responsibility to look after themselves, to use the medication as prescribed or even your vitamin, small thing, but Good mom, good baby, and also good family. Okay, I'm going to take you through to the midwife now. Now, okay. Salam alaikum. Yeah, and welcome, Khawa and uh, Mr. Salasa. Um, you are 20 weeks today, and you've you've been to Kathy, and she's done your vital signs and whatever. So our first visit is basically just to diagnose your pregnancy and to see how far it has gone and where the baby is healthy and normal and then just to address all the other 
um, other symptoms or minor disorders that you might have. So um, what we will basically do today is we weigh you and, you and you've done most of your vital signs like the blood pressure and your urine and those things with Kathy. So what we do today is we weigh you, we work out um, like your PMI and, your, um, and we see all the others we go through, your family history and so forth to see whether there is anything that we should be concerned or, or that we should plan for the rest of your pregnancy. All right. So first, we should do, um, uh, again, like she's done the history and everything around there. So what we can do first is just to see, what, were you in hospital with any ailments with this pregnancy before you came to us? So we can sign that off now, that there is nothing um, for what, before you came to us, yeah. So we will just go through all the pregnancies that you've had. Um, we will list them and the hospitals where you had them and whether there was any complications. Okay, that is the first thing that we do. Um, and then, of course, we, we go through your medical history. If there's any medical problems that you do have, if you are on any medication, um, then you should also indicate that. And then if you've had previous operations, major operations before, um, and then any allergies that you might have and so forth, okay? Okay, so just to confirm again, Hawaii, you said your first baby, your first pregnancy was in 97, and you had, and that baby was born at Constantia Burke, and it's a little female, it was a little female, all right. The second one was 2001 at uh, Christian Barnett, and that was a female as well, all right, with no complications, all right. So your third one was 2007 at um, Kingsbury, yeah, and that was a uh, it was male. It was a male, yeah, no complications as well. Then 2009, another male also at Kingsbury, all right, and then the last one was 2001 at Alnesa, yeah, but also no complications. Okay, yeah. then also. Um, your family history now, we're going to go to the family history. Is there anyone with diabetes, hypertension, cardiac problems? All right, so those, and you understand why we go through the medical history, because those are the things that we are predisposed to much later in our lives. But um, when you grow a baby, you sort of burden the body and the organs. So if you are predisposed and... Um, now the organs, the, the body has a similar scenario than when your organs are much older because they don't function because of the pressure of the growing baby. So whatever you will have then might um, then present now. Um, we don't have to plan it for, for diabetes because it is your granny. So if it was your mom or your dad, we would have done those testing. All right. Um, then, did you have a pap smear before? Up to each of the babies. Okay, you have. All right. And your results is okay. I see you indicated that your results is okay. All right. Um, then certain bloods we're going to do, like a blood grouping. We're going to check for any infections and we're going to look at your iron level. Okay. Then I see that you've had a scan this morning. Yes. You've had a scan. Okay. And everything according to the sonographer was okay with your scan and um, she did discuss with you the size of the baby, yes. the weight of the baby. Your baby was a little, uh, was breech at, um, at this time but there is still enough time for it to correct its position. So we're not going to worry mo mostly about that. Your afterbirth um, is not low so we also don't have to worry much about that, okay? So and she, did she indicate to you that there is something that she would want to see in the near future? Yeah, she, she noted about the fluid. Okay, that she would just want to check your fluid yeah. again at 28 weeks, okay? So we will just highlight that on your on your chart that you're coming back for for your checkup, yeah, all right. And you're okay with that? Yes. Yeah, it hasn't changed. Because your dates also were just around about the 17th of August, okay? Um, breastfeeding, are you going to breastfeed? Yeah, you will attempt, and Kathy is here to assist you with the breastfeeding, and you did successfully breastfeed, okay. 
then the contraceptives you don't actually have to go into now if it is something that you would want to but it is available I have to tell you that it is available and we have some um, methods available like the injectable and the oral contraceptives and then also recently the intrauterine devices but that is something that we do at six weeks post delivery and after your nephas then you have um, enough time to think what it is and, and we do a, f a formal screening and see what it is that you're qualifying for. So that is basically what we're going to do on your first visit and then of course your your examination. Alright? Okay. Mm -hmm.